Part 8, I'm on 2 continues now with History 11 to 13, the Middle Ages. Pilgrims, pilgrims to Walsingham argue about their beliefs. This priest looks happy. His bishop has let him go on a pilgrimage. He's going to Walsingham, to the shrine of Our Lady, Mary, the mother of Jesus. And he's treating it as a bit of a holiday. Here's another pilgrim. He doesn't want to go to Walsingham. He's been ordered to go as a penance, a punishment for gambling. He's got to walk all the way without shoes. And his feet are killing him. Our third pilgrim looks rather worried. That's because his wife is going blind. He's going to Walsingham to pray to Our Lady to cure her. Does that feel better, my son? I have some little skill at healing. It takes a priest to take away the pain inflicted by another priest, Father. Only God, Our Lady, and the blessed saints can take away real pain, my son, whether of the body or the mind. Hey! You down there! Is this the way to Walsingham? Yes. These people are visiting Norwich Cathedral. It's something to do on their holidays. They aren't all going for religious reasons. If you live in Britain today, you don't have to be a member of the church, any church. But in the Middle Ages, you did. If you lived in Western Europe, you were a Catholic. And at the head of the Catholic Church was the Pope in Rome. He ruled the church on behalf of God. From him, through his officers, came God's commands. His most important officers were archbishops, then bishops, and at the bottom were the ordinary parish priests. In religious matters, all the others, the church called them lay people, had to belong to and obey the church. The Pope was also responsible for abbots, abbesses, and their monks and nuns. There were over 2,000 monasteries in England alone. Then there were the organizations of traveling preachers, the friars. Even in politics, the Pope had great powers, giving orders to emperors, kings, and queens. So whether you were a king or a peasant, many parts of your life were influenced or controlled by the church. In fact, the church was responsible for all sorts of things that nowadays would be looked after by the government like education, the care of the poor, the sick, the elderly. The church even had its own courts, and a priest could only be tried in one of them. As well as being all-powerful in religious matters, the church was one of the biggest landowners. Bishops and abbots, like other feudal lords, held their land from the king. Surrounded by the power influence and presence of the church on every side, it's not surprising that people believed in God more than most of us do nowadays. Norwich, where I'm standing, gives you some idea of the importance of the church in the Middle Ages. To start with, there's this cathedral. It completely dominated what was then one of the five biggest towns in Britain. As well as the cathedral, there were lots of churches, maybe over 70, and lots of priests, one to every 50 lay people. It's more like one to every thousand today. Each time you went to church, you were surrounded by reminders of the things in which all Christians believed. Pictures of Mary, God, and the apostles. If you were baptised a Christian and did what the church told you was right, then, when you died, you would live with God and his saints in heaven. But if you didn't, you would join the devils and sinners in hell. Sin! 
limbs, a rotten teeth burning in the mouth, but you can buy forgiveness, pardons, blessed by the Pope himself. And look, holy relics, a knuckle bone from St. Peter's right hand, a feather from the wings of the angel Gabriel, and a piece of the true cross itself. For a small sum, you can touch the nearest things to God on this earth. <laughs> Relics? I picked them up on the road back there. There's no wonder the partners make so much money. And how can you buy forgiveness? Well, at least the money they get goes to the poor. Well, doesn't it? Sometimes. Ah. You're getting a bit above yourself, aren't you? Just you remember, God's put everything in order. The world with its seasons, and society with each man in his proper place. Well, there's the king at the top, then the lord, and then somewhere right down the bottom, you. Oh, I know my place, but it doesn't stop me thinking, does it? You should just show a bit of respect to those above you, like the priests, for example. Priests? No disrespect to you, Father. But there's a priest near our village, he can hardly read. He does the service in Latin, as he must. We don't understand it, of course, but neither does he. Mind you, he's got no time to learn all that. Why not? Too busy dressing up and chasing women. There's about as much chance of him going to heaven as there is of me throwing three sixes. Ah. Ah, I will throw them away later. You'll suffer in hell for your sins. You'll hang by your tongue from a tree of fire. But you do believe in heaven and hell, at least. Well, of course I do. It's bad priests and monks and friars that I don't like. There's nothing more certain than hell. We're all equal in death, and we'll all be judged. I saw a mystery play once. It showed sinners in the world of the dead. They were saved by our blessed Christ on Judgment Day. Principes porta tolite. Open up and let my people pass. To most medieval people, heaven and hell were as real as Italy, the country where the Pope lived. And a lot of them thought that they were sure of going to heaven if they cut themselves off from the world and devoted themselves to God. Monks and nuns did this by living in separate communities called monasteries. But they still had a responsibility to feed the poor, care for the sick, and give travelers a bed for the night. Modern monks, just like medieval ones, obey very strict rules. They make a promise to God that they will never marry, that they will own nothing, and that they will always obey their abbot. Much of their life is spent in total silence. They try to serve God by studying, by praying, and by laboring. Cistercian monks have always been known as farmers. You may not be able to visit a present-day monastery, but there are plenty of ruined ones around, and you can work out quite a lot for yourselves about what a monk's life was like. The church was the heart of the monastery. This is what it looked like in the Middle Ages. Just next to the church was a covered walk called the cloister. It was built around a square. The monks spent much of their lives there, studying and copying the Gospels and other holy books. The cloister arches were open to the weather, and while they got the sun in summer, it must have been very cold in winter. This was the chapter house, where every day a chapter from the monastery rule book was read, and where monastery business was discussed. Next to the chapter house was the dormitory, where the monks slept. At the end of the dormitory was a double-decker toilet built over running water. On the right, a separate channel carried the sewage away. 
The kitchen was further downstream. This is where the kitchen used to be. It's outside the main building, and like the toilets, it's built over running water. I expect you can guess why that was. The food was probably quite cold by the time it reached the dining room over there. Although monks lived simple, hard-working lives, monasteries became very rich. When people died, they often left money or land to a monastery. By 1420, monasteries owned a quarter of the land in Britain. Most people met their parish priests far more often than they did monks. The priest was usually a peasant like themselves and probably wasn't well educated. He might know only enough Latin to take church services and religion to teach people the Ten Commandments. But as a priest, he had the power to baptize, marry and bury them, to give them mass and to forgive their sins. He also knew a lot about people's problems. Well, my son, bless me, Father, for I have sinned. Two days ago, my wife gave birth to a child. Father, yesterday it died and you were away from the village and I'm afraid that since the babe was not baptized, it will go to hell. My son, it's true the church teaches us that those who refuse baptism will go to hell. But do you think our gentle Jesus would punish a newborn soul? It wasn't the child's fault that he died unbaptized, but mine. Yet you should have let me know that your wife was near her time. It's my duty to tend the sick and to send the dead on their way to God. I'll arrange a burial service and you won't have to pay me. And now, is there anything else that troubles you, my son? I cursed my neighbor and wished him ill. And why was that? Well, his animals, they, they trampled my crops. I understand. But you do repent. Yes. You're forgiven. Any large organization needed money to keep it going. And in the Middle Ages, the church took a tenth of everyone's income by way of tax. This tenth, or tithe as it was called, was often paid in kind, perhaps sheep or corn. And it was stored in tithe barns. As you can see, a tithe barn was huge up to 50 metres by eight. This one holds enough to feed an army, but in fact, most of the produce was sold. So where did all the money go? Well, some of it went to support the parish priest. There were some priests who had several parishes. They took tithes from them all, looked after one, and pocketed the difference. But there were plenty of priests who took just enough to keep themselves alive and gave the rest to the upkeep of the parish church, to the poor, and to the bishop. But if the bishops were so rich and powerful, why did they need extra money? To pay for hospitals, just for a start. This is a ward in the great hospital, Norwich. It was founded by a bishop in 1249, and more than 700 years later, in fact, until only a couple of years ago, elderly people still lived here. These little cubicles were put in in the 18th century to give people some privacy and somewhere to put their belongings. Before that, the sick or elderly were housed in open dormitories. The sick were treated with medicines made from herbs, and a lot of them really do seem to have worked. Treating colds by a herbal inhalation is a very old remedy, and so is using water to bring round someone who's fainted but I don't like the look of this eye operation. Today, the great hospital has a well-equipped sick bay and the elderly have their own housing. This is one of the oldest parts of the great hospital, the cloister. We've already seen that cloisters were used for studying. They were also used for teaching and the first students were generally people that wanted to enter the church. You see, the church 
was the only big international organization. It had its own law and its own language, Latin. Even a parish priest needed enough Latin to say the daily services. The higher clergy needed much more education than that. If you became a bishop or an abbot or an abbess, you might have to advise the king, act as a diplomat or manage a vast estate. That's why the first proper schools grew up around monasteries and cathedrals. By the later Middle Ages, boys' grammar schools had been founded, but the teachers were still churchmen and very strict. A reading book says, Dear Master, if we do not learn well, we beg you to beat us. But a schoolboy's rhyme said, I wish my master was a hare, and all his books hounds were. And I myself a jolly hunter. To blow my horn I would not spare, for if he were dead, I wouldn't care. <laughs> <laughs> Most of what I learned at school was beaten into me. Me too. Didn't hurt as much as this, though. Never mind, you're in good company. Many's the king who's walked barefoot to the holy house. Well, the last mile from the slipper chapel, anyway. <laughs> it must be very important. It is. My wife's going blind. I had this image made in wax to leave at the shrine. When it's blessed, she may be cured. Well, go on, laugh. No, faith can heal. Real faith. And I'll take back some holy water to bathe her eyes with. Don't take it all. I need some too. <laughs> For yourself? To cure the lepers of my village. I've come for them. There'll be an all-night vigil. Will you join me? Yes. If my wife's cured, I'm going to come back here again with a gift. I would have thought the church was rich enough already. You have no right to... Will say... you pray with us tonight? Perhaps. I probably won't be able to sleep anyway. Because of being so near the shrine? Nah, because my feet will be killing me. <laughs> oh, come on, then. Or we won't even get to the slipper oh, chapel. Right. The Slipper Chapel was a mile outside Walsingham. Pilgrims used to leave their shoes outside and go in to pray. Then, without shoes, they walked the rest of the way to the Holy House. Shrines like Jerusalem, Rome, Canterbury, Compostela in Spain, were visited by tens of thousands of pilgrims every year and an official souvenir industry grew up round them. If you wanted to show that you'd visited a particular shrine, you bought a badge. This badge comes from Compostela. If you couldn't afford the badge, you simply put a scallop shell in your hat. And this one comes from Walsingham, where our pilgrims are going. The badges were mass-produced. You simply poured hot lead into a mould like this, waited for it to cool, and then out came the badges. Other craftsmen were employed to make little bottles which would be used to hold holy water or oil which had been blessed and which would then be rubbed onto wounds to soothe and hopefully heal them. The priest and the married man will have theirs filled when they get to Walsingham. But what about the gambler? Will he still be just as scornful when he gets there? full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. <laughs> 